All right, and we are now recording. Give a few more minutes here for other folks to join us. Thank you for joining. Hey Dan, can you help uh, Amber put on the, the after photo for her photo sim? She's struggling with that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, kind sir. All right, perfect. It, it's it's coming through. It's great. Yeah, sometimes those things just take a lot, especially when there's a lot of content uh, layered in on the image. Okay, sounds good. Murals fickle. Mm hmm. Yes, yeah, so we've got a good good crowd here. Why don't we uh, go ahead and get started? Hey, Betsy, good to see you. Um, as people um, join us throughout, that's great to see some new faces as well. Um, I know we have uh, Mayor Sadler online and Mayor, you wanna open up the conversation and welcome these fine folks for joining us and on their evening just before dinner. Sure, I would love to. Um, good evening, everyone. And, and welcome back again to the um, uh, symposium workshop on 15th Street corridor. Uh, appreciate everyone for taking out the time of the busy schedule to uh, uh, participate in this work session and developing a plan for 15th Street corridor. We all know that it's a uh, uh, hot issue, hot topic. Uh, we all are excited about it, uh, that we have the opportunity to um, <clears throat> have the community to come out and give input. So, but uh, please let's, let's keep in mind as we uh, work through this process that we have to come up with a plan that DOT will support and endure us. And uh, because it is a DOT uh, corridor. So let's keep in mind that uh, DOT is the funding source, uh, not the city of Washington it will be DOT. Uh, funding it. So uh, thank y'all and welcome again and uh, enjoy the uh, conversation and all the input. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sadler. Uh, Jonathan, you want to um, say a few words and maybe describe a little bit what we've been doing the past couple of days? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, again, just want to thank everyone for participating uh, as part of this process. You know, we've, we've been discussing this for several months through uh, survey data we've been gathering, as well as a couple of other previous public input sessions. Um, I think, you know, it, part of this three-day series of, of workshops is uh, the intent is to develop a, a conceptual design that we can, uh, you know, flesh out in further detail, uh, then, then, bring, then bring back to the public as well as uh, engage DOT uh, in order to try to reach some type of compromise. But we do have a lot of uh, 
variables at play for the whole project and different areas of uh, treatments for from commercial to uh, office, institutional and residential. So, uh, you know, we've had great, great input. I think the numbers are up a little from yesterday evening, which is uh, uh, good to see. And I think that's an, an important part of this process is gathering as much public information as possible. Uh, but again, uh, you know, as part of part of this would be compromise and working through uh, the suggested changes and treatments we would like to see. Uh, but again, thank you everyone for their time, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Terrific, thanks, Jonathan. And for those who don't know him, Jonathan is your town manager. So uh, everybody obviously knows the mayor is, and now obviously uh, Jonathan has been instrumental uh, himself. Aaron, Barikia, uh, Betsy. Uh, Kane have all been helping along with the mayor to help guide us through this process. And you're right. I think Mayor Sadler uh, spoke well and, and direct. Hey, look, this is a this is an NCDOT, Department of Transportation, owned and operated road. And so we need to be cognizant of that and be respectful, um, but get something that the community want. And so that's really um, our discussion as we move forward. So I do see some new faces that are joining us uh, over the course of probably about the past three to four months, um, we probably have interacted with probably 1,500, Dan, uh, plus or minus people, or 1,000 or 1,500 in some form or fashion, either it's through a project symposium, which is an open house, where we had uh, instant polling to ask you some challenging questions, or a survey that was on the project website, or interactive map that we had on the project website itself, or some of these stakeholder groups that we're conducting throughout the uh, course of the process. So bear with us. If you hear us repeating things that we talked about yesterday or the day before, it's just really to inform the folks that have, um, have been gracious enough to join us this evening. Remember, our last day is tomorrow. And that is um, in terms of the design charrette, which is a multi-day design workshop, where you'll be able to see even more detail as we go into it. So tonight, uh, you'll see more detail than you did last night. And so that's the way this works. We continually work throughout the day with engineers, uh, urban designers, landscape architects, and planners um, making this, uh, you know, kind of re-analyzing, uh, but also redesigning the 15th Street corridor. So let's jump right into it. I'm going to get out of this PowerPoint thing here. And I'm going to jump into this platform that some, most of you have seen. It's just a interactive way for us to interact with you in a different way to show you these designs, especially during a COVID area. So in here, you'll see a number of folks in here moving around. This is our project team. And as they design things, they upload it into this, um, onto this platform called Mural. And I'm gonna first jump down here. Uh, let me, to back up just a little bit, folks, if you're new to this, I just wanna be real brief and very direct, our project, starts over here and, and someone just make sure they um dan thumb up if you can see this uh the aerial the pap absolutely all right so it really starts from brown street here and goes 1.6 miles off to the west all the way over to us 17 business which is carolina avenue and it is 1.6 miles so and you can see we're just trying to look at things strategically like the intersections that you see here as well as mid-block crossings and, and, and the like. We, yes, um, I would be uh, a fool not to tell you what, we, what we've been doing a couple these past few days, but part of that exercise is talking with people. We're still listening to different folks. Um, so we've hosted six uh, kind of back-to-back -back focus group discussions, which are really topics, topic areas, anything they want to talk about, we can hone in on that. One of those groups, um, uh, one of the groups, the first one was emergency services, fire, rescue, police. And they told us some interesting things. Uh, speeding is very prevalent along here. We talked to, you know, Chief uh, Drakeford about cars actually speeding up and going through red lights just to try to beat the lights. So there's a lot of travel behavior that's a little bit questionable. Um, those are just some of the highlights there in emergency services. We've also talked to people like the fire police, uh, fire and rescue about the, uh, the, the issues of stop and go, but um, really getting across the street and getting some of these tight skewed intersections with a large vehicle, a large fire truck, in fact. So we wanted to be cognizant of that. 
Our next group is appearance and beautification. And again, all of these comments uh, came directly from them. The need for pedestrian walking path, uh, no crosswalks like signals, dangerous crossing 15th and market to walk to cemetery. Uh, all of these things came from your folks that live, work and play along this corridor that represent the appearance of beautification. This corridor itself, it's not really all about beautification. That is a priority, but it's not the top priority. Our priority is safety, safety for all users of the corridor. And right now, this corridor is designed primarily for vehicles. We all know that. There's no amenities or treatments for pedestrians um, or bicyclists or people that are disabled trying to get across the street. And so that's, we gotta be really uh, understand the nuances of how people go travel from A to, A to B. The next group, bicycle and pedestrian advocacy. We knew there was a big push for this. So they brought up things like ADA compliance because they see folks out there with a wheelchair trying to get from A to B and trying to cross that four lane uh, arterial. And uh, interesting thing, the number one thing that came through in a multimodal standpoint was the problems of crossing the road, just barely the basic premise of living in a city. How do you cross the road? And if that is, um, you know, if that's our biggest problem or if that's an issue, that should really be resolved way before we come into this and start redesigning the corridor. That is something that we have to take for granted when you, work, when you live in a city and work in a city. Crossing the road should come naturally and safely. Um, another one that, tail, uh, that stands out at me is all ages and abilities. What they mean by that was if we do put in a bicycle pedestrian or a pathway of some sort, we wanted it to cater to more than just, you know, people in their spandex on the, that want to get on the road to go for a, a, a 50 mile uh, bike um, trip on a day, you know, like Dan Hemi does. Um, there's not a few, a whole lot of folks there, but there's an interest. But the, really the reality is we want to cater to more we want to cater to that young child, maybe that 10 year old that has a bike helmet that wants to be safely on, on a side path or outside of the travel lane, all the way up to the folks that want to maybe go for a run or an elderly couple that just wants to go for a stroll in the evening. The next group, the fourth group we talked about was economic development. And um, this was really interesting. It was a great group. And I say that only because they knew about the troubles of getting their constituents to and their clients to their, their businesses and the development community and working with the development community. Right now, it's not a very safe and attractive corridor. Uh, they do believe that, you know, reinvesting in this corridor is going to add to um, opportunities for the private sector to respond um, to, for redevelopment and development. Not to say we're pushing out the existing development but um, really to improve what's there today. And they truly believe that, you know, calming traffic, um, and managing expectations for travel, as well as providing multimodal uh, facilities is gonna be the key to that success. And of course, the gateway and beautification that comes with it. We wanna make this attractive, just like you did for Fifth Avenue or Fifth Street in downtown uh, in your waterfront. Yeah, and they're also, their context, I love this quote right here, you know, what does 15th Street look like in, in 10 to 20 years from now? What's missing? And I think um, you know, they, they, need to, they know their work is cut out for them just because we put public dollars into this corridor. What does that mean for private reinvestment? It's not to say we're taking away property rights or anything. That's not our purview, but it's going to be natural to think that folks want to reinvest and maybe even start up a new business, you know, that incubator uh, to start up a new business along the corridor or revive one that's already there that may not be the highest and best use. And I love this quote. Uh, one of our constituents said, hey, 15th Street can be our second nature uh, signature hole, like, like in a golf course. The Front Street, the Fifth Avenue, or Fifth Street is a signature hole on a golf course, and so should this be. Doesn't mean they have to be identical and cater to the same users or same businesses. In fact, you can do much more, and there's a lot of gaps and we'll talk about that in a little bit, about who works and who plays mm -hmm. and who owns property along there and the needs, um, not only for residential need, uh, business needs, but for residential purposes as well. And that uh, leads us to neighborhood and HOAs, uh, home, um, homeowners associations and the like. And these are the folks that live along the corridor. And a lot of those communities, uh, um, you know, lower income communities, uh, I think it was 19%, Betsy helped me out, but I think 
uh, 19% of those rental properties do not have vehicles, do not own a vehicle. So all of their chips, trips are done by walking or by riding a bike or calling a dial a ride service, which is very expensive. So we need to be cognizant of that and, and do a little bit better for those folks that are traveling around uh, without a car. And so they too are also talking about pedestrian sleeves. And what I mean by that is really making healthy connections from the neighborhoods to the commercial and retail development along the corridor, even trips that are being made for medical clinics and the hospital. And the last but not least, business community here. Um, we heard a lot from those folks that own businesses or either lease um, uh, property to run a business along here. And their biggest concern to, uh, that I heard, maybe someone else can chime in, but I think it was really parking. They, um, the last time y'all went through this exercise when DOT um, did the great unveiling of, of the road widening and super street project, it took a tremendous amount of right of way and personal property from y'all, and as well as um, parking spaces. And those things are, as you know, are vital to any business um, economy. So parking spaces and impacts to private property, also access, access to those businesses um, was a major concern. So whatever we do, we want to limit what we did along there and um, make sure that we're being cognizant and really aware of how people are ingress and egress into these businesses along the corner. But lots of good, good in, in, uh, information. Um, last but not least, they also want to know during construction, how, how, what can we do during construction to minimize, you know, delay and minimize the impacts and the disturbance along there. And I'll let um, our, our engineers, our other engineers in there to talk about that a little bit later on, but we'll set up kind of a phasing program to understand what that looks like. And I think that's going to be important too. So those are our focus groups. And again, uh, really great involvement from a number of folks that helped us along there. So what are we looking at? For those of you that weren't here last night, um, this is what it looks like today. This is your cross section today. It's extremely narrow in terms of the property that's owned and operated by the Department of Transportation or the state. Um, it is, it's also called right of way. That's the area that's owned and maintained by the state um, uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation. It's 60 feet, that's not a whole lot of distance. And so I, one day when this was um, you know, dirt road and they paved it and then they just added two lanes in there, they never bought additional right of way. Um, and that was really the crux of the problem. So we, our mantra was to stay within, not only within the curb to curb, but stay within that property that's already owned by the state. Now. Um, when we do that, that's not to say that we may or may not go outside of that area at the intersections to accommodate maybe a left turn, uh, pocket, or maybe a multi-use path uh, as we go through here. But that's basically the, the playground or the sandbox that we have to play in, right? So looking ahead, we want to repurpose and pull in, pull in that curb and gutter. We're just getting rid of one lane, if you think about it, pulling that in there and putting in being responsive to the folks that, um, that aren't behind a, a wheel, but being responsive and, and trying, providing them a good safe haven to walk, to ride a bike, to jog, uh, maybe in an, uh, if you're disabled, a, a wheelchair uh, along this corridor. So sidewalk on one side, that's all the room we have on there. And on the other side, we have the ability to put in a 10 foot, what we call a side path or multi-use path. A lot of users from eight to 80. We don't expect um, those professional bicycle riders to be on the side path. They would probably elect to be in the travel lanes if we give them enough room in there as well. So we're working on that, but keep in mind, all of what you see here, we are trying to keep it confined to what's out there today in terms of existing right of way and existing property that's owned. And that's important to understand. Now, one thing that may or may not be included in the schematic as we apply this to the actual aerial, above is the use of street trees. Some of those street trees, much like you did on Fifth Street, um, we may not have enough room with. We may have to do a volunteer street program and ask property owners if the city or, the, or, or, or Department of Transportation buys and the city maintains those trees, is it okay to plant a tree on your property you know, for beautification and for, 
to provide um, canopy and shading for people that want to walk along the, uh, the multi-use path. All right, so I'm going to stop there. And you know what? Feel free to use that uh, the chat box. I think uh, Dan mentioned that earlier, but if you have things you want to um, you know, express, good, bad, and ugly, that's why we're here. We'll listen to your ideas. The whole premise here of this ongoing transparent planning process is if we hear things and you want us to change things, we'll, we'll tackle it, we'll challenge it, we'll push back a little bit. Um, if it sticks hold and makes a good sense, we'll keep it, we'll incorporate it. Um, if, if, if it's not, we'll go on to the next big idea that you guys share with us. And already we've made a tremendous amount of edits already to what we're seeing. I'll go through some of the things um, that we're putting together and then I'll get back down to some issues that really have um, done an, a good job here. Um, with our design folks. I'm gonna zoom in here. The first one is Minuteman, um, Minuteman Lane. Basically, there's no driveways here, but this is the Washington Plaza, kind of looking at a skewed direction. Um, and it's and again, some people have seen this before, but we wanted to show you what we meant by moving in um, the curb and gutter. This curb and gutter right here, as long as you can see that, we're basically pulling that in and reducing it from a four lanes down to three lanes. And we think operationally that's gonna work tremendously better than what's out there today. As you know and I know, those inside lanes, when someone gets in there and turns on their blinker to take a left, everybody's jockeying position to go to the outside lane to go around them. So in fact, the four lane is really operating today like a three lane, unfortunately. It's not a four lane divided and it's not a five lane road. And if we were to do that, we'd be taking your property just like what was shown you know, three years ago with DOT's plan. So, our premise is to take this outside curb and gutter and to bring it inward, inward, um, in order to provide some room to put in the multi-use path along that corridor and then put in pockets of median. Here would be a great place for a pocket median because um, there's no curb cuts here. So what does that look like? Yes, our, you know, our, our, our urban designers took the liberty to be a little bit um, uh, gracious with their, with their uh, artistical style here. But as you can see, you have a travel lane here in the curving gutter. You have roll curb on the inside. Um, so the plantings may, be, may not be as glorious as what you see here, but you get the premise, right? You have a median in here that would be plantable and, and use some local vernacular, local tree species and, and plantings that we're seeing in, in the downtown area. And then out here, you see the 10 foot multi-use path. You have pedestrian style lighting with a banner kind of really celebrating this area. And with, with this degree, we're hoping to slow down cars a little bit. And then back here, you see the old uh, Mexican restaurant here. We're not saying get rid of the restaurant. We're just saying, wouldn't it be great to have some outside seating and cater to more than just, you know, uh, you know more business for that, for that business that's there today and really take advantage of that old um, you know, style of family style um, decor and, and look, you know, facade treatments, outside seating that's covered with some nice, uh, um, uh, maybe bike parking areas and, and the like, but um, repurposing that parking area that's really being underutilized or, or not used at all in that parking area. And as we know, we, we understand this whole area, I guess, is up for sale and on the market, Washington Plaza. We're not telling folks what to do with their property, but we're saying, what if, what could happen based on what we're hearing folks and the desire. There's a big desire from this community, it sounds like, for outside seating and, and, and boutique and smaller restaurants to go get a sandwich, to go meet up with a friend, maybe even have coffee somewhere. And that, that's awesome. Down here is Van uh, Norden. We had talked about putting in, if you think about it, crossing the road. I think Vanessa, I forget her last name, but that's a critical issue, crossing the road. And when you don't have um, high visibility crosswalks, you don't have an intersection to do that, people are crossing this, you know, they're jaywalking. They're running out and taking their life in their own hands by running across here. And it's happening all the time. In other words, no one is going to walk a thousand, twelve hundred feet down here, just across the road, and 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 Vanessa kind of confirmed that earlier today when we were talking to her. She lives off of um, off of uh, the side street here, uh, Van Van Norden. So what would that look like in a mid-block crossing? Um, we actually changed this crossing from Rapid Flash and Beacon 
to a hybrid, a hawk signal. It's an actual hawk signal to stop boats because we know in this area you could you your traffic ranges from thirteen thousand to twenty thousand vehicles, and so stopping them is going to probably be important in order for folks to get across there. So you can get a feel for the multi-use path. You still have a through lane. Now you have a dedicated left turn lane here. And then you have a hawk signal so that when someone kicks the button or pushes the button, it'll stop traffic. And that signal can be timed appropriately with the other existing signals. So you can have a progression control signal system to a certain degree. Dan, what do we have in the comment box? Uh, go ahead and unmute. Yeah. I am, I am muted again. Uh, nothing so far. I uh, just put out a reminder to everyone: if you do have questions or comments as you're going, even even if you know we're we're sort of presenting something here, feel free to leave those questions or comments in the chat box. We will be bringing them up at regular intervals, and certainly uh, we want to encourage you guys to. This is really a, an opportunity for open dialogue on what you're seeing. We want to know uh, so that we know what we can improve upon. And Mike, you're muted. Okay, thank you. Um, so let, let's get down to it as well. Uh, let me see here. So a lot of you are asking, you know, what, what is the road? Now, this is very draft. I want to show when we apply this here um, that we understand what we're looking at. So we're going to start from the west and head our head east. At the end of this, this is actually designed in AutoCAD, which is a computer software that is a design computer software that our engineers are using to actually show you what the physical impacts and the physical um, footprint would be along this entire corridor. And I will say to you that now you can see we have property lines in that you can probably see here. I'm zooming in as much as I can, but you'll see that we have, for the most part, are staying within the property lines that are there. So no property takings as of now. Um, so we'll have to see how that transcends as we move along. But you can see in here that even Carolina Avenue over here we reduce the lanes here down to uh, uh, two lane divided, but we still have a dedicated left and a through right. And we're still keeping this the same orientation. Um, one thought, a no number of people ask us, hey, why don't you think about putting a roundabout at this location? Well, um, only because there's multiple lanes on Carolina Avenue, we didn't want to be too bold, but that might be something that you may want to look at when we get into final design, um, if that's appropriate. So we would design a traditional intersection here that has a high visibility crosswalks, the pedestrian countdowns, the lighting, and the, and then the appropriate um, uh, landage here. There's not a whole lot we can do here. Um, mast arm signals are, are a must. We'll show you what that looks like a little bit later on. Um, also, when we go through, you can see the gray line in the back. That's your multi-use path. It goes all the way on the north side of the corridor, all the way through. So as we go through here, you'll see pockets of median. Yes, our premise with the median is that if you have a standalone business, um, we wouldn't put that median in front of you because you have one way in and one way out. So we wanna be cognizant of that. Number two, we also wanna be um, very aware that there's opportunities for cross access to be built in, especially when you look at the north side of the corridor. All these streets from Minute Lane, Minuteman Lane are go one way in and one way out. Paul Street, Jackson Street, Bennett Street, it's really, it's really unfortunate, but those are dead end streets that are not connected at all to one another. Even this shopping center here, the Washington Plaza, um, the Fitness Unlimited, the, the tractor um, supply, and this, this area right here with the new multifamily back here is one way in and one way out. And you cannot afford to do that. You have to put in if you want to get people off of 15th Street, you've got to give them more than one choice to do all of their trips. Right now, everything has to funnel into these businesses, ingress, egress off of 15th. You're doing great on the south side with the connectivity, but on the north side, it really needs some help. So as development occurs, development and redevelopment occurs, the city has to require more connectivity with adjacent um, uh, complementary uses, I'll say that. So with a tractor, tractor supply, you have a stub out here that could easily um, parlay nicely into this property that's future development. You actually have a stub out here and a stub out here. So when this develops, require them to put that in. So as we move down here, a lot of the key intersections, you'll see we have high-vis crosswalks, pedestrian countdowns, nice stop bars, 
Uh, masked arm signals is what we would advocate for, cleaning up that wire clutter that's on the top. Um, again, more cross access with, that we would be advocating for. And here's the premise. We know, we know we're not gonna be able to get a lot of the cross access. And it may only come through redevelopment, to be honest with you. But if you memorialize and get at least 50% of the cross access, especially on the Northern side, you're gonna save yourselves a tremendous amount of pressure being placed onto 15th Street. Um, but be happy if you don't get 100% of these cross access um, you know, recommendations. And it only happens through redevelopment. And then we also have uh, the quality intersections here, right? And there's Washington Street. As we move eastward, you can see that we're staying within those white lines, which are the property rights of others. We have the sidewalk on the south side, all of that staying within there. This is just a draft and we know this is gonna change, but you can see now we have dedicated left turn lanes at all of these cross intersections that we intersect with. Now people have a dedicated safe haven to make a left turn at these critical intersections. Some intersections we wanna really celebrate like we're doing in Carolina Avenue. We would recommend planter or um, um, pavers or brick even at these to really say, hey, this is our community, this is 15th Street, this is our commercial market street. We want you to celebrate that and, and really, it's more of a place making and an opportunity to really say you've arrived. But you can see here, I think, uh, uh, Mary Day, you were asking about Market Street, um, protected left turn bays at all quadrants here, nice high quality visual, uh, high vis crosswalks, pedestrian countdowns, uh, we'll add in the street lighting in there. And then last but not least, masked arm signals, clean this up, clean up the clutter. So as we move eastward, more opportunity for, for median placements, we know these medians are gonna uh, probably get smaller, not bigger. Uh, meaning we're going to probably have to shorten them up to a degree. But then last but not least, we come to the end. And this is the, the potential roundabout at the intersection of Brown Street. Um, as you know, we have a five-legged awkward intersection at this location. We're not taking any buildings with this. It's a one-lane roundabout. At the inscribed circle, we over-designed this. And um, we could probably, if anything, during final design, shrink it down. So that's good. And even shift it to avoid, you know, potential property taking. So uh, what this does is really help 12th Street here to better align in here. Because right now it's a, it's, it's a death trap trying to take a left turn out of there. Um, but it really slows people down, too. This is the best traffic calming device that you can put out there to slow folks down. And according to your chief of police, Drakeford, um, this is the number one or one of the top signals that people are speeding through at red lights because, you know, it's, a, it's a, you know, I call it the dead man's curve here. And then you have the five legged in here. No one knows who's going to turn out in front of them. And everybody's trying to get through this light as quickly as they can. The roundabout will slow them down to 15, 20 miles an hour, but it will allow continuous flow to continue through the corridor. And it's last but not least, a really awesome gateway feature to say to people, especially out of town travelers that are traveling through your community, to slow down and you can anticipate to see more bicycle and pedestrian in this corridor. So take your time and enjoy, maybe stop for a coffee or for a snack or, or sandwich and, uh, and spend money here in Little Washington. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any questions before I move on to some other exciting visuals that we wanna show you. And again, this is, this is draft, it will change. Anything from the comment box? Yeah, Mike, you've got, uh, we've got two comments. The first from uh, Ned uh, and saying that, uh, you know, the pedestrian crossings at intersections and, and walkways, uh, those are now, uh, that you know, having those would knit together what is currently a very divided set of neighborhoods, divided by 15th Street. So that greater connectivity that's not possible right now uh, would lead to better livability, greater ease and, and comfort, and, and obviously safety, something that uh, the neighborhoods haven't really seen a lot for years. Also noting it meets the uh, goal of the 2023 strategic plan for the city of keeping the integrity of the neighborhoods and creates that same ease of movement that they see currently down on Main Street. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that was a, more of a comment, right? Uh, that you didn't note, Dan. Pardon me? 
I had one other comment that you didn't know. Um, wait, 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 just say it. Come on, Ned. Yeah, just, just say it out loud, Ned. <laughs> well, what it does is it means the north side of town begins to look like the south side of town. A lot of wonderful development has been done on Main Street, downtown, the waterfront walk. It means there will be not the same kind of thing, but a walk and that same feeling of graciousness and ease and safety on the north side of town that isn't there now, but is on the south side of town. So it'd be a great balance. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment. And, and here it is. We don't want to compete. You are right. And then you brought this up and it's good professor of memory, but it bears repeating. We do not repeat or want to replicate what's downtown on Fifth Street. Even the way it's designed might be a little bit differently. Um, the, certainly the treatments for bicycle pedestrian are different, um, but even the development, what you are encouraging after talking with the Chamber of Commerce and economic development folks, even the business community, there's a different desire for different um, retail, commercial, office, and even residential. We're gonna get into that in a second. So don't think that one size fits all, but we can cater to different needs in terms of goods and services up here by this public investment, but that's good. Yeah, um, encouraging the pedestrian sleeves and good, healthy walkability that's safe, no matter where the environment, this is not your downtown downtown, but certainly there's a desire to go from A to B along this corridor and across it. So good, good points. What else? Yeah. We well, so the second comment comes from Candace Moore. Uh, and she's saying, you know, there's, there's two lanes feeding into one lane on the rendering where, uh, and this is 1403, that might need some clarification. I don't know if that means where 14th Street is feeding into 15th or, or something else, uh, but where 1403 feeds into 15th Street. Has there been any analysis on congestion that this might cause feeding two lanes uh, down to one lane on 15th Street? Uh, and she knows that currently where 5th Street feeds two lanes into one, uh, the traffic light gets very congested, especially during uh, busy hours, during those peak hours. Gotcha. And, and, and again, and that's, that is our trade-off, Candace. I'm not, I'd be remiss if I didn't repeat that again. You know, what you're giving up is one lane. Um, and yes, it's going to reduce the capacity, but not to a great extent, because right now that four lane, no one's building four lane roads in the entire United States. They're very unsafe and they don't carry the carrying capacity of a five lane road or a four lane divided road. And the reality is when everybody, and you all know that if you have a pair of keys in your pocket right now, you know, and you've all experienced, if someone puts on that blinker in that middle lane to take a left turn, you now reduce that throughput to down to two lanes. So in essence, your four lane is working like a three lane. And that's the reality, especially during peak hour, because no one wants, behind, wants to be behind that left turning vehicle. And Betsy, you brought up a good, I don't know if Betsy Kane is on here. I didn't, I didn't want to be the I only yeah, yeah. This, but share your thoughts on that. You brought up a good point about capacity and, and really um, what this looks like. Uh, you want me to speak? Go ahead. Mike, uh, about capacity. Well, I mean, essentially we don't have four lanes now. The, the two inner lanes in the middle of the road are both left turn lanes. So they constantly stop and the traffic jockeys around them. And then you're in the right lane, which is the right turn lane. And so the jockeying back and forth creates constant movement conflicts and it creates uh, stopping and slowing frequently. And so you get a safety hazard because you have a lot of rear ends and you have a lot of visibility problems as people lane jockey around those stopping and slowing cars. And so in effect, when you go from, you, you don't really have four travel lanes at all. All of them are turn lanes. And that's why nobody builds these roads anymore. So the capacity doesn't actually go down that much. Um, it, we may lose a little bit, but, but what you gain is flow, is that you have a lot smoother flow and I think I heard you, Mike, talking about timed signalization along the whole corridor. So if you go the speed limit, you're going to hit the green lights, and, but you're not going to be speeding. You're going to be, it's more like slow and flow instead of stop and go. Is that, is that about right? Is that what you were hoping to hear? Yeah, I think just explaining that uh, 
you know, it's a challenge, right? It's a challenge. Um, we know we're not going to have the same capacity as a four lane divided or five lane. Um, but the key is it's really about safety. And I think removing those cars that are left turning, give them a safe passageway with a dedicated center lane is, is one, one of the keys to success, but also slowing down cars as well. Um, so, but there, it, it will, Candace, to your credit though, it will impact the way cars will flow. We're hoping that instead of going 55 miles an hour on like on this corridor, we can get people down around 35 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour and hit more green lights. I'd rather go 35 and hit green light after green light after green light. If it's, if it's part of a progressive control signal system, that means all of the signals are communicating with each other. And if someone decides to speed along there, they're probably going to hit a stoplight every other stoplight. And that's just the way business is. So um, we're hoping that everything works together. We repurpose some lanage and make some safe haven, some safety improvements for left-turning vehicles, but we also coordinate these signals that are uncoordinated today. Good job. Mike, we've got, a, Mike, we've got a related comment to the uh, roundabout. So there's been a couple other questions that have been asked, but I think I'm gonna skip over back to yours, Laura, uh, because it's, it's, it's related to that roundabout and, and to some of the congestion comments that, that uh, we've been talking about. Uh, Candace asked again, how will emergency vehicles manage? Uh, and I think that relates both to the pocket medians as well as to the, to the roundabouts. Perfect. That's a good, good question. Um, yes, this is designed for the biggest vehicle that you have coming through this corridor. This is designed for a WB50, which is your standard 18-wheeler tractor trailer. It also accommodates um, your largest fire truck into this corridor. Um, if you can see here, that tan area is actually a truck taper. The inscribed circle in here is more than what's needed to accommodate those two vehicles. I think it's around 125, if I'm not mistaken, but we will label that. So it will do a much better job, in fact, of, of allowing turning radius than what's out there today. Remember, 12th Street, you come out here and it's almost impossible to take a left turn and go back up um, 15th Street. I want to see you do that with a tractor trailer or your largest fire truck. I will challenge you every day. But they can now come in here and do this. It is designed appropriately for that. That is a great question. What else we got, um, Dan? Yeah, all right. So going back now, because it was asked ahead of time here, uh, Laura asked, what's the length of those left turn pockets? How many cars can fit? Yeah, it depends. And so if you think about a car being a typical 20 feet long, right, um, it depends on the, the length of that. So we'll have to let you know as we, as we do it. So if you have a 100 foot um, pocket median, that could, in essence, back to back to back to back, accommodate um, four cars in there. Keep in mind that you're going to space them out a little bit, but you can certainly do that. But if you think about a car in a parking space, a regular parking space, it's about 20 feet long. So a hundred foot um, um, median will accommodate about four vehicles appropriately spaced on that. So that's a good question, but we'll, we'll look into that too. I will say that- just, um, Mike, I was just, I was thinking about the, you know, that you need to decelerate a little bit in there so that you're not decelerating in front of the people behind you. Mike, you're on mute. These things are tricky. We, yeah, and that's a great point, Laura. So we know in some of these, like this one right here, this meeting here, we're gonna pull that back and make it more of a, um, a, a turn lane or a reversible turn lane in some of those pockets, yep. In order for that to, you know, to get enough space and taper it. So the way we're showing it here is kind of schematic-y, hate to use that, uh, that terminology, but what, but the reality is we will taper into the median, right? As you typically see, and then we'll allow it to flow right into a protected left turn bay. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop right there because more to come on there. Um, what else do we have here? Here's a perspective here. Um, this is just for you, Mary Day. You are asking about Market Street. You know, it's one of the center intersections that we have. Um, this is day one of a schematic we're showing in SketchUp here, but you can see here, if this is east and west on 5th, 5th, uh, 15th Street, 
And here's the lane that you'll see there. So you have a left turn pocket and your through lane, through lane. You have your stop bars and high quality intersection, ADA compliant ramps. This is looking really, really nice. And then you also have these mast arm signals with, with um, your pedestrian countdowns here too. And that's important because what's out there today is really a cluster. And this is one of your signature intersections that people need to understand they're going to see more people. But each, each approach has a dedicated left turn lane where it doesn't have it today. And I think that's really, really important because it gets rid of the sight lines. Remember, a lot of people have complained that when you come to an unsignalized intersection, some of the signalized intersection in the five lane section of 15th Street, that through lane is blocking left. If you're trying to take a left turn, the opposing through lane is blocking the sight distance. So you have to take your life into your own hands and we've all done it to get in front of that left turning vehicle that's parked right in front of you. And so this is kind of what it looks like, cleans it up nicely, I, I do believe. We'll show you some of the structures um, tomorrow as we put in the buildings in the background on here. These are some of the other perspectives too. And this is kind of a, a plan view image of what that, that same intersection looks like. All right, I wanna get into something else here. And I think this is day one, but when we do put in, okay, um, should I stop, Dan? You wanna talk about um, comments? Chat yeah, box? So, yeah. uh, a couple more comments. Uh, we'll go, uh, go back up here a little bit uh, from uh, um, Ms. Barnhart. Uh, what about a crosswalk in the vicinity of Holloman Street? Currently there's considerable walking traffic between apartments on the north side and neighborhood streets, pharmacy and east west streets on the south side. So, uh, Mike, you are on mute again. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out where Holloman is located. <laughs> Holloman is down by the, uh, yeah, by the church, the mid block crossing. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so we we have um, there's Holloman right there too. Yeah, this is a bad skewed intersection. Let us work on that because I really don't like the offset here. Who made that comment? Barnhart? Is that what was the first name? Um, uh, gosh, Elizabeth, 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 right? Right. Elizabeth. Oh, it's Elizabeth. Yeah. Oh, she was on our um, focus group. So, Elizabeth, really, yeah. Really... I really don't like the offset here. I wish there was something that we could do about it. I'm almost thinking like, if you think about it, the offset is such a place and it's unsignalized here, but even having something that goes between these two that could potentially connect up. We did this in another similar project. We called it a Danish crossing, but let us take a look at that as well. Um, it may break up some of the, uh, the crossing, but of course we have one up here, right, Dan? We have a mid block that we're proposing up there. We do. We do. Uh, so uh, we're proposing so uh, a mid-block uh, crossing, and you saw that rendering of Van Norden, um, uh, maybe looking at a uh, Hawk Beacon, what, what, what you, what you saw, saw there. there. Right, right. Uh, they would allow, uh, they would for, allow that for that kind of crossing. crossing. You know, let's work, Betsy and, and Jonathan, based on that comment, we might want to suggest um, two locations to do this, to break up that. Um, right now, if you think about it, and this is where we came up with our, you know, our reasoning behind here. It, the distance between the adjacent signals at this location, this segment right here, between market, and I'll mark it right here, market, right? I'm going to measure this distance. Bear with me, folks. But the distance between where people can safely cross an intersection that is signalized is, get this, 2,800 feet. And nobody is going to walk, you know, 1500 feet out of their way to cross the road. You're going to run across the road. And I guarantee that's what Elizabeth and her folks are doing if they live off of Holloman, because we heard the same thing about people accessing the cemetery. So it might behoove us, Betsy and Jonathan, to put in two crossings uh, along between those two points, just to break that up and do it into something more palatable. And that way you get your crossing um, every 900 feet. I so love some it. Say that again. I like. I'm I'm liking it. All right, perfect. All right, let's go back. Um, the last thing I want to share with you folks, and keep on continuing with your. And I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, continue with the conversation because this has been great. We are memorializing everything that you say, and it looks like there's more chat. I'm gonna um, talk about development and redevelopment in a second, but go ahead, Dan. 
Yeah. Uh, so another comment, uh, and this is from uh, M. Kavanaugh uh, saying, um, we're talking about sidewalks uh, and, and the, I think the shared use path as well. Uh, what happens to those existing trees, telephone poles, and mailboxes that would have to be moved in addition to the danger of walking or riding bikes on the road or sidewalks? And I think this is uh, maybe a question about right of way. Yeah, so good point. So when we move the curb in, right? Yes, we'll have to move your, your mailboxes with them. That is a good point, but that's an easy fix. That'll have to be part of the cost of doing business and that'll be paid by the project, I'm assuming, unless someone else corrects me. That makes sense. The trees, I don't think we're impacting trees. Keep in mind now, the trees, unless someone correct me, um, most of the trees, if not all of the trees, are outside of the right-of-way today, right? But we're, again, we're moving the curb inward to accommodate the multi-use path. And there's no trees to, um, along the roadway as we know it. Basically, we're getting rid of the outside lane where there's no trees. So we're moving in the curb. Um, what we are hoping with that and that, um, um, with your comment was is that we want to add trees later on down the road too. We want to have a volunteer tree program to plant even more trees on the outskirts to provide shading to the sidewalk on the south side and to provide shading to the multi-use path on the north side. So we would actually add trees. I don't think we're taking away, uh, I may be wrong, but I'll look into that and answer that definitively. Um, hope that answers your question. Sorry, I wasn't direct. Dan? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one, other, uh, one other question here, and I think this is kind of coming back around to uh, the conversation earlier about emergency vehicles. I'm uh, wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about how emergency vehicles will be able to use the, the, the sort of the whole of the corridor? No, that, that's a great question, the whole of the corridor. So we, we worked with emergency fire and rescue and police and, and um, <clears throat> I'm hoping a couple things that happen. First and foremost, you know, they struggle just like you do. Um, one of the things that they had made us change or verify is the use of uh, roll curb in the median. Um, in other words, what we're saying is we wouldn't plant any trees adjacent to the median uh, curb there, but it would, during emergencies, if push come to shove, that fire truck, that police car, that ambulance could roll up onto that median to go around a car that just happens to be um, disabled or that can't get out of the road for some, some unknown reason. That's a good, very minor um, design detail that was very valuable. Also, the, me the, the roundabout was very well received because it allows larger vehicles, like we mentioned earlier, like the fire trucks, to maneuver more freely and to, to get access to those, those all five of those approaches and ingress, egress uh, a little bit re more readily into and out of Biden Hospital that's located there. So that was that's a good one. Um, along the corridor, they're, you know, they're going to travel just like anything else. The one thing that we would advocate for once this is a progression control signal system, we advocate that all the signals tying into one another and on one controller, we would highly advocate that um, they, the police, fire and rescue have preemption along this corridor. And I think that's very, very important. Um, that way they push a button and that light for them turns green all along the corridor. You don't want to do that every single day because you, you'll get the people on the side street to be very angry. But um, yeah, I think preemption along here would be vitally important because there's a hospital, because there's medical cl clinics. And um, actually, the fire station is just off the other end of the uh, 15th Street. So I think it's a great option. Dan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, a couple other comments. Uh, first from Sheila, will an overpath crossing work near Holloman? Yeah, we always hear about the story about the overpass. The problem with it is, is getting people up to it. If you had bigger topography that you had slopes that you're dealing with, um, I would say that could be a viable option. But no one wants to climb stairs or ride their bike in spiral staircases up there, you know, because you have to have a clearance. Remember, you have to have a 16 foot clearance if you go over a road because of high vehicle truck, trucks and the like. So I don't think anybody's going to want to climb stairs just to walk, you know, 25 feet across the road. No, just like Miss um, 
Miss Valerie's doing today or, or Vanessa's doing, you're gonna, they're gonna run across the road. That's exactly what they're gonna do. It's gonna take them less time, um, less effort to do that. But that's a good, good, good thought. If it was rolling to, if we were in the mountains and if it was rolling terrain and we, get, we could put a bridge between, you know, side by side and not have to uh, walk down, I think that would be a viable option. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can you can look at the example from from New Bern. New Bern has a uh, an overpass crossing for pedestrians uh, just south of the uh, just south of the Trent River there in James City. I used to live right next to it. Uh, yeah, and it's not getting a lot of use because it's a long walk up. Yeah, James City. That's actually in James City, right there at the railroad tracks. I know it well. Every oh, time yeah. you go to oh, the yeah. beach, you see no one on there, and it's and it's actually a burden. It's a maintenance burden. But go ahead, Dan. Yeah. All right. So uh, another uh, another question, a comment. I think this is maybe again, maybe it's a good opportunity to talk about sort of limitations on the right of way and, and takings. Fred says, uh, I think a four lane road with a center turn lane is what's needed. That can be done in the existing 60 foot right of way. Uh, questions whether or not a roundabout is needed. Um, and we want to begin uh, maybe speak to speak to that. No, I, I agree. Along the corridor, um, yeah, retrofitting that down to three lanes, it can be done within the right of way. True, the the roundabout is really an intersection. So, um, and I think it, you have your. And I guess this is not the final answer. You have your choice at that five-legged intersection. That's really bad, badly skewed intersection. You have your choice of trying to make that work in terms of keeping it the way it is and try to retrofit in crosswalks, but you're still gonna have a problem with turning vehicles in there and understanding who has the right of way. Um, and also, honestly, I think in terms of operation, uh, you know, it, it, today it's gotta be dysfunctional for you folks to go to that five-legged intersection, who has the right of way and when the light turns green and which direction has that, I think it's gotta be, in terms of operation, it's gotta be at, um, 10 times worse than the, than the, than the roundabout. If the concern is that people aren't used to roundabouts, um, you know, that there might be a, a, an opportunity to do an education campaign here. Betsy, that might be something uh, just to help people inform how do we go through this? What is it? How does it make sense? Who has the right of way on this one? But I will say that that roundabout will probably work uh, much better than the five legged intersection and the dysfunctional signal that's there today. However, that said, you can keep a traditional intersection. Um, if you want to, you, if you're getting into the final design stage later down the road when DOT hopefully endorses this, um, keep that as opposed to the roundabout, if that's the kind of general consensus of the folks. Hey, Mike, hey, this is Betsy. Um, I'll just say I've lived in a number of communities where a roundabout had never existed and then was installed in several locations and, uh, and worked as a transportation planner um, in locations where, you know, the roundabout was a new concept about 20 years ago. There was a lot of fear and anxiety, but what's amazing is anyone who's driven through one once or twice, it's absolutely intuitive and easy to use, particularly a one lane roundabout. Um, I mean, there's really only one thing to do, which is go around the roundabout. And when you get to your street, you turn off. So you eliminate left turns, you eliminate crossing movements, conflict with other cars, you eliminate T-bone crashes, you eliminate head-on crashes, you eliminate running red lights, you eliminate all of these problems. It is the easiest thing in the world to drive through a roundabout. And I think what happens though is everyone's afraid that everybody else won't know how to do it. But the, the first time you do it, it's, you know, it, it's just so easy. It's like falling off a log. Um, and so, so safe compared to signalized intersections. Um, so I'll just, I'll just put in that personal experience having lived in a community where they, they came in and there was a lot of fear and anxiety and they, actually they, they did so much better. It was, it was amazing. Mike, I think you're on mute. Yeah, my, my, my screen just went. So let's keep on going with that. And I'm going to bring up my mural again. So we'll keep it going with the uh, chat box. Thanks. Sure. Uh, sure. So uh, uh, related to that roundabout comment uh, from Sheila, who will teach drivers how to drive in the roundabout? 
Uh, Betsy, I, I think you may have already answered that um, with your point about it. You know, once you do it once, it's it's intuitive. Uh, but uh, you know, Mike, I don't know if you uh, care to sort of add to that. Uh, no, no, you're, you're right. I mean, it's just, it's changed. That's all it is. And I, uh, you know, I, I worked on a project Hillsborough Street in Raleigh, North Carolina for 15 years, and now they have six roundabouts there, which is a little overkill. But that first one was a doozy because everybody was, you know, a little bit apprehensive. It was changed. So um, it's a wonderful gateway. It's the best traffic calming device you can put in there. So um, I would advocate for it if, if, if you feel comfortable with that. But it's really a community choice. Dan? Uh, well, other than uh, we have a comment from Laura that says it is easier for people in a four-way stop, and that catches us up to uh, up to speed on the comment box. They're coming in fast and furious now, though. Awesome. All right, I'm going to go back as I I'm back on to um, the mural. So, folks, what we want to do now is show you this show you, uh, or at least talk about in what happens when we make this public investment. I'm going to share my screen. There you go. And Dan, if you can verify, you see the mural? I can. I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, one of the areas that we wanted to talk about was um, the area that the Washington Plaza and, 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 and up there. We're just going to pick on that for a second. You know, as we look into this, this corridor, um, we know when we put in, I feel like a broken record, but when we put in the public um, investment along the corridor for improving the infrastructure, including the sewer line that's underneath 15th Street, we want to expect, and hopefully, we beautify, we, we make it more pedestrian friendly, more walkable, more bikeable, uh, help, and much more safer for the traveling public, no matter what mode they're taking. And then, hopefully, private reinvestment will occur. So we talked with um, your Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development, even your business community about what that would look like and what could we see? What are the gaps within the system? What are the gaps within the community, especially in this corridor in terms of commercial, retail, office, light industrial, um, and, and then residential as well? What does that look like? And, and, and so one of the things that we came up with, we kind of did the what if, right? What if we played around and did some free site planning? So we know that you know, uh, I won't pick on Washington Plaza, but that's probably seen a lot of turnover. I think it's on the market right now. What a wonderful footprint because it's, 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 it's great, valuable part property. Um, and not telling people what to do with their property, but we wanted to show kind of what if we look at on the north side, because um, that's the worst connectivity along the entire corridor. Um, and I'll, what I mean by that is I'll highlight it here. And this is the last thing I'll, I'll talk about. If you look over here between Market Street, right? Well, we can see that. And this is Market Street, there's a cemetery. Then you have the residential pocket right here. But when you look here, you have all of this new development and, and greenfield. All, look at all of this um, greenfield or, or undeveloped property. What we're not doing a good job with and shame on the, on, on the city um, is advocating good connectivity. You have all these wonderful stub outs, right? Even right here, here's, uh, there you go, Rodman's, and maybe I'll, I'll jump down there, but it actually stub out to nowhere, even though it's a future stub out. You have another one down here, and another one here. So you can see, uh, we missed an opportunity to, to, to link up this property here. Now we have all of these units, and probably gonna, there's going to be more units. Now they have one way in and one way out. Likewise with the tractor supply, they, their, their ingress egress is all on 15th Street. This property here is probably doing the same. All this property back here is vacant. Then we have um, Washington Plaza here, but all of these residential, look how long this is. It goes back, it's the world's longest cul-de-sac. All of the traffic that goes on these streets, they're not even interconnected. All of them have to go on to 15th Street. That means every single trip made out of that household or business has to get on 15th Street. So in the future, when development happens and redevelopment happens, we want to advocate for better connectivity. So that's just really common sense, especially between complementary uses like this.
So what does that look like? Now I'll get off my, uh, my man wagon here, but let's look in closely. So if you look at this property today, what would it look like if we looked at a neighborhood connectivity and suburban corridor retrofit and create some more placemaking opportunities in this area? And again, we're not telling people what to do with their, their property, but we are looking at holistically um, you know, what we can imagine um, in terms of the, the, the development style or the connectivity that we would encourage, encourage in this area. So just to give your bearings here as we zoom in here, this is the tractor supply here. I think that's the open, open area that they put out some uh, machinery out there just to more curb appeal, all the sea of parking in there. But this is um, Washington Plaza over here. And that's the Mexican restaurant right down here. So what we're saying is advocating is, or suggesting is if redevelopment is happening, not just here, but along the corridor, think about the importance of connectivity. And then also think about um, things that would be attractive to the development community. Uh, we heard about affordable housing from Vanessa who runs affordable housing in this region. And so there's a big demand for multifamily. Uh, there's a big demand for affordable housing and for service workers. We heard that from Bob Rich, who mentioned who owns, who's an owner of uh, the Midtown Crossing, um, and which is this area over here. So, and, and he has service workers that can't afford to live here. They live in Greenville and they commute. So um, there's opportunities there to cater for different markets. One of the things that we would advocate is if this redevelops, what would it look like? Right now, it's that old style, 60s style, suburban uh, big box with a sea of parking that's empty for the most part in this area. So what would that look like? If you, if you did some infill out parcels here, you could see as we get closer in here, even setting up a, a healthy grid network that would allow good walkability with street uh, trees or um, uh, sidewalks and the like, parking, uh, and then really doing better job of connecting up some of these uh, adjacent parcels. Here's one those with the stub out that we talked about earlier. There's that uh, Alderbrook circle down there. We'd connect that up as well. And again, you can orient that different ways. Um, so this one down here would probably be um, uh, office or retail, but uh, commercial on the front. It may be even two stories, and we'll show you what that looks like down here. It could be anything like this. These are just precedent images and, uh, of some mixed use opportunities that aren't high dollar by any means, but really attractive places to maybe meet with a friend for a cup of coffee or, or a snack or have lunch and grab a bite to eat. Um, as we push back further and you can see some Main Street versus Main Street, some very walkable environments. We have townhomes over here, potentially you can put townhomes in here. We have these four pack and two pack units. What I mean by that, that's residential. Not everything needs to look like a multi-story apartment complex. This is probably an, uh, an apartment. This is kind of an eight unit. It doesn't even look like an apartment. Um, here's some other ones that are townhouse house oriented. Four packs, when we talk about this, is multifamily apartments and blended into neighborhood scale. That looks very uh, unique and uh, very attractive to the renter. Um, these are duplexes here uh, or fourplexes. And as we go down, even as we go down, let me go back up to the schematic. Um, as we see, you can see that as we go to residential, all the way back is your single family, but you can see we could do a mix of higher density housing here, smaller single family or, or smaller lot size here, and then you have some smaller lot size here. You can connect up these any way you want to. But the, the, the beauty of this, and maybe some backside loading on here, now we have apartments, now we have affordable housing that can cater to more and to, of your market that's out there today. Um, here's a good example of the smaller town cottage feel. It could be for retirees, who knows what that market is. And we would encourage you to do your market analysis to take a look at that. Smaller homes, smaller lot size, uh, cottage homes, and then single family narrow lot size. We see a lot of this as well, popping up all over the place. And then you can pepper this throughout with public art, open space, um, and even celebrate that tributary that's in the back there. Here's just one example of the project that we worked on, restoring the features of that, that stream in the background there. I'll show you in a second. And then connecting all the way up into that, um, that baseball field that's in the back there. So as we look at that, there's a big demand for open space 
in this area. So one of the things we tried to do is maybe even put in a multifunctional soccer or football field here and, and parlaying nicely into that existing baseball diamond in here. Uh, pedestrian refuge or pedestrian walkway going across the stream. And then you have um, you know, your pond, your, your stormwater retention is all throughout here. Here's one that's existing for Alderbrook. Here's one here for the multifamily that's here. So now you can really get a sense commercial retail on the front edge, making it more walkable and a, a nice healthy grid system so that we can connect some of those high density or multifamily units um, into the street using those pedestrian street sleeves to pull people in. So I'm gonna stop there because I showed a lot of information on here, but it's kind of like those what if, just reimagine what that space could be and the value goes um, for those property owners and for opportunities for other businesses just go uh, are really tremendous dan what about the chat box i don't want to scare people but i, I did want to think you know just what if we're not telling people what to do with their, their their land by any means but we're certainly looking for opportunities that if we put in the public investment private reinvestment will will respond accordingly yeah absolutely no i uh you know only one comment just now from betsy uh to say well wow <laughs> I know that these guys are great, but yeah, um, even the water features that you have, just celebrate it. Everybody loves a good natural setting. And right now it's kind of like no man's land. No one's taking advantage of that, but you're right. Now this becomes, I'll tell you what, now you're really competing with your downtown. Wouldn't you be loved to just come here and go for a walk through the trail system, go to the, go to the, have your kids and some friends and go out to the, in an activity park or do something in the, the multi-use area and then, then meet up folks with, for, for lunch on the patio of outside seating out here. It's just, you just really think about what's possible. And I think that's tremendous. What a tremendous asset and destination. You're really making a sense of place and those placemaking opportunities are few and far between when you retrofit corridors. Dan? Yeah, uh, so uh, one comment, I think this is getting back towards the corridor here uh, and, and 15th Street. Uh, Ned asked, what, uh, wondering what cost, time frame, and business impact would look like during construction. We had that conversation in the focus group earlier. Any estimates? Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I, I will say, if we were just dealing with the street and just dealing with what we're recommending for redesigning, it would be very easy. Because remember, we're only moving the curb on one side. So that would be easy for us to traffic control that during construction. The problem is this, and a lot of people don't know about it, but the, the you know, Jonathan, I would like for you to chime in here if you're on here, that's uh, Jonathan Russell, the city manager. Um, and that is there's an underground, uh, under the road, there is a um, uh, sewer line that runs through there that's old and dilapidated that needs not only to be replaced, but relocated. So we are helping that relocation by the way we're designing this, right? As we pull in that curb and gutter, we actually can relocate that storm, uh, storm water, that sewer line over here, okay? We can do that over here, but in order to do that, we're gonna have to rip up the middle of the road. Not we, but the city as, and that city's gonna have already coordinated with NCDOT on the need and desire to do that. So Jonathan, you wanna, you wanna chime in on that end? Your thoughts? Um, yes, I mean, the, the sewer main that runs down the middle of the road, uh, that's probably the biggest utility that would, re that would require any major relocation, you know, water and sewer, we're making some minor adjustments to, as well as the electric utility. But again, that, the logistics on that with continuing traffic flow and while replacing that and keeping everyone serviced uh, you know, would be a logistical challenge, but something I think we could work through. Yeah, and, and here's the other saving grace. So the bad news first, let's give them that. So Jonathan is the deliverer of bad news. I'm hopefully the deliverer of good news. Okay, just kidding. But the reality is this, um, um, as we go through this exercise, the saving grace, this is the best feature that we're bringing to the table, the right-of-way process. In any project in North Carolina, and I used to work at DOT, Department of Transportation, but 
up to 70% of the cost of a project is for right-of-way acquisition. It's absolutely insane how much right-of-way costs. With our proposed cross-section and the limits and the avoidance of right-of-way takings, we virtually bring that down to a minimal effort. And again, only at the intersections where we're making some, some minor changes here and there. So the right-of-way process in terms of duration is gonna be much less than then the project of widening this corridor and taking additional right of way, the project that DOT came up with um, three years ago, you know, the widening and bringing it to, to four lane divided. And with that, the cost not only goes down, but the duration of the project goes down as well. So now you're really focusing on construction and construction duration. Um, a project like this, 1.6 uh, miles, um, depending on the level of effort for the sewer line and how we manage that, I'm hoping this is less than a year that we get to make this happen, maybe a little bit more if they're in construction. So there will be some pain to make it right. But once it's right, it'll be a, a signature corridor for your community. Dan? Signature hole, you might say. Um, one, uh, just one other comment, uh, coming back to the, uh, uh, coming back to that, uh, the, sort of that site plan, that, that conceptual what if that you were showing earlier saying those folks could get across 15th street as well if they wanted to go to the waterfront downtown and walk around main street lots of connections to and from oh yeah absolutely and now what lacks on the north side of 15th street is east west connectivity and now we're not saying a direct shot we never want to build a street flat and straight because it's going to cater to speeding so what we have here are plenty of opportunities for people to come in have a little, uh, uh, you know, do some shopping, go to a restaurant, do a, a hair appointment, go to a coffee shop. And then, you know, they can walk into this community, they can walk over here. So now, even for a car, a car is concerned, we can go all the way over to Heritage and Minutemen, whereas today you can never do that. And I think this will eventually get over to market. So from market to Heritage Drive you in Minutemen, now you should have a continuous or a connectivity, vehicular connection, and of course, bicycle and pedestrian with it on the north side without getting on to 15th Street. And when you do that, you take trips off of 15th Street. Absolutely. Good, good sight. Any more comments on the chat box, Dan? Uh, we are caught up there. All right. All right. So it's, um, you guys have been with us for an hour and 20 minutes. Again, more to come. I apologize. We're going to clean up some of these rest, uh, renderings, but I think you get the picture of what you all have created. This is not what we have created. This is what you have created. We're just giving you thoughts um, along the way, and then you guys obviously challenge them and say, correct that. That doesn't make sense. So um, to all kidding aside, though, you guys have been wonderful to work with. Um, a lot of this imagery, I think, is going to be placed onto the website a little bit later as we get it, but... Be with us, stay with us tomorrow, hang in there. Right now we got 42, 45 people with us, but tomorrow will be the grand finale. We'll show all of this from, from start to finish, the, the, the draft um, concept designs that you see here, we'll show streetscape elements in that. We'll show more before and after renderings, much like the ones you see here that really show a different perspective and some obliques. We're gonna actually show an oblique of you, the proposed roundabout, um, which is more to come, but that's going to be really interesting to show you how it would look like in a bird's eye fashion. So stick with us. We hope to see you next week or next week. We hope to see you tomorrow, same time, same place. And if you have any problems, just go to that, um, that website and the link is on there as well. And of course, Aaron Rule will take your comments in the, in the same token. So I'm going to turn this back over to Mayor Sadler to close out the meeting. But thank you for your time, folks. You've been wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out uh, this evening, taking part in, the, in the symposium. Um, great information, great comments. And we look forward to seeing everyone uh, tomorrow evening and have a good evening. Thank you. Enjoy your, enjoy your dinner. Take care. Right. Take thank care. You. Good evening, guys.